powerful message. So, in this series, we've talked about God's promise to Abraham to give him a son. And we talked about the mistake that Abram and Sarai made concerning Hagar and Ishmael. That um, time was going by, they were getting older, they had a promise that God was going to give them a son, but um, it wasn't coming to pass, and so they took matters into their own hands, and they reasoned and came up with ideas as to how they could get God's promise to come to pass in their lives. And so, enter Hagar, which was Sarai's slave, and the idea was that Abraham would be with Hagar and that they would have a son through her. And that was not God's plan because the promised child is Isaac. And the promised child came through Sarah, not through, um, not through the slave woman, Hagar. And so they made a mistake, right? Even though they made this mistake, God's promise was still available to them. I said, even though they made a mistake, God's promise was still available to them. And so if you're listening to me right now, everybody makes mistakes. But the question is, what do you do after that mistake? Because what they did was they got back in the program. They got back to God's promise. And they got back before God and spent time with Him. Right? And so if we make a mistake, as everybody makes mistakes from time to time, if you make a mistake, you are not eliminated from experiencing the promise that God has for your life. Amen? Amen. So I believe that that that's for somebody this morning. When they realized they screwed up, they turned back in faith toward God and entered His rest concerning the promise that He had given to them. Did you hear what I said? We're talking about freedom through rest. And what Abraham did was he entered back into the rest of God. And we're talking about that today. What is that rest? How did they do that? You know, we we know that Abraham was 100 years old. Sarah was 90 years old when they had this child. And uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but that's a miracle. Amen. (laughs) That was a miracle that they were able to have a child at those ages, 190 years old. That was a miracle from God. You know, sometimes God just holds off on that miracle a little bit longer just so that when it comes, people will realize and be able to know that there's no other way that this happened except because of a miracle, amen? And so man can't take credit for this. This was God moving and working in their lives and bringing forth that promise, amen? And so I want to take a look at how this happened. I want to take a look at what their mindsets were. I want to take a look at what does a person's life look like that's walking in rest, in God's rest. What does a person's life look like that's walking in that place of rest? How do they think? How do they speak? How do they act? And that's what we want to take a look at today because we want to be a people who enter into the rest of God as talked about in Hebrews chapter 4. We want to be a people who enter into that rest. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Romans chapter 4, verse 18 through 24 is what we're going to take a look at first. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. It will also be up on the screen for you. Here we go. This is Abraham and Sarah. And it says, this is how they entered in and possessed the promise of God for their lives. It says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. And so became the father of many nations. Against all hope... Abraham, in hope, believed. This is how they did it. This is how they possessed the promise of God for their lives, that they would have a son, and that through that son, they would be parents of all nations. He would be a father of all nations, Abraham, right? And so this is how they did it. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed. What we were talking about is that there was no way that they could possibly have a child at that age. There was no hope for them of having a child. But against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. Even though it was impossible in the natural, God had promised it. And because God had promised it, they believed it. And they went, to, they, they went in faith, believing God that that promise was going to come to pass in their lives. Amen? Has anybody ever had that experience before? where you had a promise from God, and then you saw that promise come into your life because you stood and you believed God, you trusted God with it. And there might have been different uh, 
stories for everybody in how that came to pass. God encourages us. God leads us along. God's opened our eyes to truth. God teaches us how to walk by faith in his promises so that we can experience everything that he desires for us to experience, right? And so I don't know how it looked like for you in possessing that promise. Maybe there are some people in here that, well, I, I'll tell you what, let me, let me back up. I was going to say maybe there are some people in here that haven't possessed that promise, and maybe there are. But I'll tell you what, every single blood-bought child of the living God has possessed a promise of God. Amen? Well, how did you do it? You believed it in your heart and you confessed it with your mouth and you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior for the forgiveness of your sins, right? And heaven opened up to you. You become a child of God in that moment and you possessed the promise of eternal life, amen? It was through faith in God. It was by grace through faith that you received that promise. And every promise that you will ever receive from God will come the same way that you received your salvation, by grace through faith. Amen? And Abraham, against all hope. I love that. Did I say that before? Against all hope. Against all hope. Against all hope. There was no hope. It was a hopeless situation. But right in the midst of that hopeless situation, against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed. What caused him to believe in the middle of a hopeless situation? Huh? Come on. What caused him to believe in the middle of a hopeless situation? The promise of God caused him to believe. He grabbed a hold of that promise that he had put down on the inside of him. And it was the promise of God that carried him in to fulfill the fulfillment of that promise. It was the promise of God. And it was the faith that comes through that promise. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. And so the more you hear, the more faith you have. The more you hear, the more faith you have. And I'm not talking about, it says be careful how you hear. You see, how do you hear? You have to hear in a way that you have the ears of faith on. You have to hear in a way that you believe what you're reading. And you put it down on the inside of you. And you meditate on it day and night. And you allow it to be planted in your heart. Why? Because when you plant something in the ground, eventually you might not see anything happening for a while. But eventually as you're looking in expectation, all of a sudden, poof. That thing comes up out of the ground, and there's an excitement about that. Why? Because you know that that's going to grow, and it's going to produce fruit, some kind, of, some kind of food, some kind of something, and you're going to be able to harvest that. That's a harvest of righteousness that you can harvest. That's God, and that's His ways. Amen? Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed and became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Verse 19. Listen to this. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead and since he was 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. So without weakening in his faith. You know, he didn't deny. He didn't deny what was going on. He didn't deny what was in the natural. He didn't deny, right, that his body was dead. He didn't deny that Sarah's womb was dead. He didn't deny it. But he looked straight at it. And he didn't weaken in his faith. Can you look straight at all of the natural things around you that are contrary to the promise of God for your life? Can you look straight at it? And can you not be weakened in your faith? Can you look straight at things that are screaming contrary to the promise that God has given you? And can you stand in faith in the midst of that barrage of lies that the enemy is bringing against you? The barrage, whatever it is, whether it's a doctor's report, whether, 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 whether it's a bill that's not paid, whether it's whatever it might be that's coming against you and that's screaming at you, that you have lack and debt and poverty, that you have sickness and disease in your body, that you have hopelessness, that you have sin in your life, that you have an addiction that you can't beat, and it's just screaming and screaming and screaming at you. Whatever that is, whatever the challenge is that's in front of you, it's screaming at you that you're never going to be free. But can you look at that thing in the eye? Can you look right at it and not weaken in your faith? Because the promise of God is living on the inside of you. That's what God has called us to as his people. And that's how you possess the promises of God. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Since he was about 100 years old and Sarah's womb was also dead. He did not, listen, he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. This is my favorite verse 21. Being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. 
being fully persuaded, being fully persuaded, being fully persuaded that God was able to do what he had promised. He had power to do what he had promised. Do you believe that God has the power to do what he's promised you? And are you stepping out in those promises that God has given you? Are you, are you living your life like you believe them? He was fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Verse 22, this is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. It wasn't just meant for him. It was meant also for us. Amen. It was meant also for us. Why? Because the righteous shall live by faith. Amen. The righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. This is the life that we've been called to, to live by faith, not to live by our emotions, not to live by the circumstances and situations that are screaming at us, not to live by anything else, but to live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith in God's promises. The righteous shall live by faith in God and in God's promises. Amen? That's how we're called to live as Christians. Against all hope. Against all hope. Have you ever been, found yourself in a hopeless situation? Have you ever found yourself in a hopeless situation? It's not fun, is it? It's not a good place to be. What was the hopeless situation that Abraham was in? There was absolutely no chance that he and his wife could possibly, in the natural, have a child. There was no way that he could have a child. He had all of this wealth. He had all of this blessing from God. And he said, God, the only person I have to give it to is my servant. You've left me childless. And God said, no, your inheritance will not go to your servant your parents will go to your son and he promised him a son amen he promised him a son and so right in the middle of the hopeless situation he received a promise and 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 the older he got the more hopeless it seemed in the natural the the, the older he got the more hopeless it seemed in the natural and so listen 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 after god gives you a promise what do you do with the promise that god has given you are you moved by your emotions? Are you moved by the circumstances? Are you moved by a, a number of your age? Are you moved? What are you moved by after God gives you a promise? The only thing that we should be moved by as children of God is the promise itself. Amen? Because it's the promise that brings us into the fulfillment of the plans and purposes that God has for our lives. And so when we cling to that promise, when we grab a hold of that promise, that promise will bring us in to the fulfillment of God's plans and purposes for our lives and bring Him glory. It's not about you. It's not about you getting glory. It's not about you being comfortable. It's not about any of those things. It's about you learning to walk with God and trust Him in every single circumstance and every single situation. And when you learn to trust in Him, there's a relationship that's built. There's an intimacy that develops. And, and the very purpose for which you've been created is to have an intimate relationship with your Creator. Amen? an intimate relationship where you know him and he knows you and you walk together as one that's what god has called us to to be conformed into the likeness and the image of jesus christ that he might be the firstborn of many brethren that's what god is calling us to but it takes all kinds of different things that are going on around us and us trusting god and walking the plans and purposes out trusting him for his promises so that those plans and purposes can be established this is the lifestyle of a Christian. It's not to breeze into a building on a Sunday morning and to breeze back out and live your life however you want to live it. No, that's not it. God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for my life. We want to seek after the plan that God has for us and pursue it with everything that we have. Why? Because we've been knit together in our mother's womb, created. God breathed the breath of life in us for this very purpose that we would live out the plans and purposes that God has for us. And so why are we out living our own plans when God's calling us to live out His plans? Amen? 
And it's by faith that we live out the plans of God in our lives. And so we need to abandon our own plans and agendas. We need to abandon those things that we desire. We need to die to those things, take up our cross, and follow Him every day. Amen? That's what this is about. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. You you know what Abraham wanted to do if you go and read the Scripture? He said, God, can't we just use Ishmael? And can't we you just bring nations through Ishmael? That's what it, God said. He had a conversation with, that's what Abraham said. He had a conversation with God about that. He said, can't we just use, man, I'm old. How am I going to have a child? Can't we, just use Ab- can't we just use Ishmael? See, that was his plan. That wasn't God's plan. Get your mind off your plans. Get your minds on God's plan. Amen? And I'm going to tell you that God's plan is, is, is it's always going to be impossible for you. It's always going to be greater than you're able to uh, be able to walk out on your own. You're going to have to have faith in God in order to see his plans and purposes fulfilled in your life. And so if you see a plan that's doable for you, it ain't God's plan. God's plan is far above and beyond us. We have to stretch in faith to take a hold of the plans and purposes that God has for our lives. Right? Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. The promise that God spoke produced faith on the inside of him and caused him to stand strong in a totally hopeless situation. If you're in a hopeless situation this morning, I want you to know that it's God's promises, God's word that annihilates hopelessness in people's lives. It's God's word, his promises that annihilates hopelessness in people's lives. Maybe you're here in this room, and you're in a hopeless situation. There's no hopeless situation when God walks into the room. And if you invite God into that situation, that situation is no longer hopeless. Amen? I don't care what it is. I don't care what it is. As soon as God is invited into that place, into that situation, into that circumstance, that circumstance no longer is hopeless because God is there. And what's impossible with man is possible with God. Amen? There is nothing impossible for God. And so if, you, if you're in that place of being hopeless, here's my, here's my message to you today. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Why? Because God has planned to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. Don't give up. Invite Him in. And that will change your life forever. It changed mine. The promise of God will change everything in our lives when we reach out and grab a hold of it and embrace it and live it out in our lives. It will change everything. For new guests, there's a welcome center right outside this door. You turn in that little card and you get what's called a promise book. That promise book has all of God's promises in it, a bunch of God's promises, and not all of God's promises, right? It was said that there wouldn't be enough libraries or buildings in all the world to hold all of the words that Jesus said if if they were able to... You keep them someplace, but, but, but there's promises in that book, amen? And when you take those promises and apply them to your lives, your life will change. I said your life will change. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. If you take the promises of God and you apply them to your lives in whatever area, and, and in those books it has different areas, anger, it has lust, it has all of these different things, uh, finances, it has this, that, and the other thing. And so any problem that you could possibly have, God has a promise for, amen? And so you need to get a hold of one of those books and you need to get in there and you need to let hope arise in your hearts as you read the promises of God. When you read the promises of God, you can't stay in a place of doubt and unbelief and darkness. Just like that woman with the issue of blood in the book of Mark, right? Just like that woman with the issue of blood, right? She had spent all of her money on the doctors, all of her money on the doctors, and yet she didn't get better, she got worse. Would you say that she was probably in a place of hopelessness? Because she had this this, this, this condition, she was bleeding. In, she was bleeding internally. She had this condition, right? And she was in a, a bad place. You know, her life was threatened by this condition. It was getting worse rather than better. She had spent all the money that she had on doctors trying to get better. But yet she was in this position where she was hopeless. She did everything that she knew to do, and it wasn't enough. Have you ever done everything that you know to do, but it wasn't enough? And you're in that place of hopelessness. And there's nothing that you can do because you've already done everything that you've known to do. And you're still in this place. And you just seem to be getting darker and darker and further down and further down. 
and you're in this place of hopelessness. But then it says that she heard reports about Jesus. I said she heard reports about Jesus. She heard reports about Jesus. And then all of a sudden, guess what happened? Hope rose up in her heart. Hope rose up in her life. Hope rose up on the inside of her. And now that person that was sitting in darkness and in hopelessness, all of a sudden, just because she heard reports about Jesus, hope rose up in her heart, and she jumped on her feet, and she ran out the door, and she ran through the crowds, and she grabbed a hold of the hem of his garment, and she says she was made ever with whole. From the top of her head to the soles of her feet, what the doctors couldn't do over years and years, one touch on Jesus' garment healed her completely, and she was made whole. You see, when, you have, when you're in a place of hopelessness, you have to get the promise of God, and you have to get it in you. If, if you know other people that are in a place of hopelessness, man, if you could just get them the word. And if they just reach out and take that word and get that word deep down on the inside of them, then hope would begin to arise in their hearts because of the truth of God's word that penetrated their darkness. And light will come. Life will come. If you just walk with them and keep giving them the word and keep giving them the word and keep giving them the word, hope is going to rise up in their hearts and change is going to come in their lives. That's what we're talking about. You see, we are Transformation Church. Transformation happens through the Word of God going inside of believers and, and that Word coming forth and producing hope and producing life and causing the promise that you've placed in there to come alive and to produce the plans and purposes that God has for your life. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. Take the promises of God, apply them to your life, and walk this out. And it's not just for your own selfish life, but it's part of the process. It's part of the process because that's where intimacy is born. You see, God's smart. He, he, did you know that? God is smart. You know, he knows that people have needs. And so he reaches out to them based upon those felt needs that they have. And, and he, 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 he says, listen, this is how you can get these needs met. And then they come into this place and they, they discover this process where they seek after him. And they, they go after God and they get a hold of his promises and they put them down on the inside of their hearts. And then they begin to see change happening. They begin to see the plans that God has for them coming to pass. And right in the middle of all of it, they realize that they're in an intimate relationship with their creator. Do you understand? That's what God wanted all along is, was that intimate relationship. But because of all of the busyness of this world and this life, everybody's running around doing their own thing. But man, sometimes it takes us being in a place of need before we discover how awesome it is to have a relationship with the Lord. Because once we are in a place of need, then we have to go after Him. We have to cry out to Him. And in that midst, in the process of crying out to Him, in the process of crying out to Him, we, 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 we begin to trust Him, and we begin to understand that He's faithful. And as we begin to understand that He's faithful, we begin to love Him more and more and more and more. We fall in love with Him over and over and over again. And we're just in awe of God's faithfulness. And we worship Him and we praise Him. Why? Because He's faithful. Amen? This is a process that God has put into place in this earth, in people's lives, that we would run after Him and experience Him and how good He is, how faithful He is. And then as we discover that, we would, we would love Him so much that we'll want to partner with Him. God, what do you want? I've been asking about what I want all this time. What do you want, Lord? How can I serve you? And then we start serving Him. And I'll tell you what, when, you're, when your life begins to come into alignment and agreement, with the plans and purposes that God has for you, and you begin to serve Him, God will move mountains to make those plans and purposes come to pass in your life as you are submitted and committed to the plans and purposes that He has. It's not about your plan, but it starts out as your plans, and He knows that. But He brings He has an open door for you to come in, even when you're still all about your plans. He has an open door for you. Now, if you're 20 years in the Lord and you're still about your plans, you're missing out. You're missing out on what God really wants for your life. You're missing out because he wants intimacy with you. He wants fellowship with you. And the way that that fellowship is developed is through us trusting him based upon the, his promises and seeing those promises come to pass. And then we see his faithfulness and we enter in more and more and more. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You, can't, you just can't stop once you experience God's grace, once you experience God's goodness, once you experience God's faithfulness. You just can't stop. Yeah, that's something you can get addicted on. 
Amen? That's something you can get addicted on, and it will never hurt you. It will always bless you. It will always lift you up. It will always promote you. It will always take you further in the plans and purposes that God has for your life. People that are on that other junk, that's just a counterfeit. It's a lie. And it'll, it'll bring death and destruction into your life. God is good. I'm just thinking, and I'm not going to go too into this, but there was just a tragic accident in Grove City where somebody was drinking and driving, and the car crashed, and people died. I don't know if it was one person or more than one person, but they died. Why? Because that person was living a lie, and, and they didn't know that God had a plan for their lives. They didn't embrace that plan that God had for their lives, and because they didn't, now they're going, they, they were heading down the wrong road, and, 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 and they, they, had a, you know, they were drunk, and they were drinking and driving, and all kinds of craziness can happen when the enemy gets us into that place where we need to have counterfeits to, to God's goodness right? We need to have counterfeits to God's goodness. The enemy's counterfeits are the drugs and the alcohol and, and, and the sex and the, all those different things that the enemy tries to pervert and use for, for his plans. And, and, and God has things that are pure and that are so much better than what the enemy has. And if we'll just partake of God's plans, we'll partake of what God wants for our lives, then there'll be peace and blessing. We just said this last week, between the flesh and the spirit, the mind of the flesh is death, Right? The mind of the spirit is life and peace. The mind of the flesh is death, destruction. But the mind of the spirit is life and peace. And so you choose which road you're going to go down by choosing whether to live in the flesh or live in the spirit. We need to live in the spirit as Christians and walk out God's promises for our lives. This is how Abraham possessed the promise of God. He entered into a place of rest and allowed God to do what he had promised him he would do. Abraham did not waver through unbelief concerning the promise of God, but was strengthened in faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. He was praising God for the promise. He was praising God for the victory. He was praising God for his son before Sarah was even pregnant. Through his praise, he was proclaiming the fulfillment of the promise. Did you hear what I said? Through his praise, he was proclaiming the fulfillment of the promise. As he was worshiping and praising God, he was proclaiming the fulfillment of the promise. When we praise and worship God, and, and, and did he have the son? Did he have the son yet? Was it fulfilled? No, it wasn't. But yet in the middle of that, when he didn't have the son, and he was getting older and older, he lifted up his hands and he praised and worshiped God, and that was a proclamation. It was an act of faith in his life that was saying, I have entered into God's rest concerning this promise because I know it's going to come to pass and so I'm completely at peace and I'm able to, I don't want to wait to thank God. I'm going to thank God now because I believe that it's finished. Amen? Let's go to Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 18. I have two more passages of scripture and then we'll close. Two more passages. Boy, that could take a long time. Two passages. <laughs> two more passages. Amen? God's word is so good. God's word is so good. Genesis chapter 22. You know, the Bible says that God's word is spirit and it's life. God's word is spirit and it's life. And when we take that word and put it into us, man, good things happen. God's word is very good. And I know that the enemy, the Bible says in Mark chapter 4 that the enemy comes immediately for the word's sake. The enemy comes immediately for the word's sake to steal the word out of people's hearts. The enemy comes immediately for the word's sake. Why? Because it's the word that's going to produce God's life in you. It's the word of God that's going to produce his life on the inside of you. And so the enemy comes immediately for the word. So don't be surprised if it's tough for you sometimes to get into the word. Don't be surprised if it, if it feels like a chore trying to read God's word. You know why? Because the enemy comes immediately for God's word. He's, he wants to pluck it out of your heart. He wants to stop you from reading it. And if he can't stop you from reading it, he's going to try to twist it in some way so that it can't benefit you. So be aware of the enemy's schemes. And be aware of the most precious and powerful thing that God has placed in our hands, and that's God's word in our lives. And, and be willing to fight to get God's word on the inside of you. Be, will, be willing to fight to get God's word on the inside of you. Even when it feels like nothing's happening, even when it feels like you're reading a, a, a textbook that you're not even interested in anything in it. Even when it feels like there's no progress, that's been, do it by faith. Do it by faith. Do it by faith. 
read it out loud, let it get down in your heart, because as you do that, and as you're faithful to do that, things will change eventually. Things will change if you don't grow weary in well-doing. You will reap a harvest. Amen? If you do not grow weary in well-doing, you will reap a harvest. If you keep putting God's promises down on the inside of you, if you keep studying God's Word and studying God's Word and studying God's Word and letting it get down on the inside of you, change will come. It will come. Just don't grow weary in well-doing because if you do, you forfeit the harvest that God wants to put into your hands. Genesis 22, 1 through 18. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am. He replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love. Take your son, your only son. Ooh, your only son. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. There's some wording here that you're going to want to pay attention to as we're going through it because there are types of and shadows in the Old Testament that have a connection in the New Testament and you want to kind of try to pick up on those things because they're powerful and they'll encourage you. And so take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. Now, take your son, your only son. Well, you, you know, I don't know. Did he have another son? Ishmael, right? There was Ishmael, right? But God says, take, he says, take your son, your only son. This is after Ishmael was already born. Well, how do we know that? Because Isaac was already born. Take your son, your only son. It wasn't his only son. He had Ishmael. But what? This is the son of the promise, right? Amen. And so listen to God. God, God said, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Who's he talking about? Jesus. He wasn't talking about Adam? Huh. Because there was an Adam. Interesting, I don't know. Your only begotten son, I understand. So there's, there's parallels that we can take a look at as we're going through here. Just something to think about as you're going through, right? God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love. And uh, pay attention, he loved him, right? This wasn't a harsh relationship. This wasn't a stern relationship between the fathers. No, he loved this boy. Amen? Your son, who you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. Oh, come on now. This is the very child that God was fulfilling his promise to Abraham through. It's Isaac that your offspring shall be reckoned. This is the very child that he was fulfilling his promise through. And that he was going to make Abraham a father of many nations. Who, how was he going to do that? Through Isaac, your offspring will be reckoned. It was through Isaac. Isaac was the promised child. And here God says, after he gives them this promise, can you imagine how excited and elated they were when Isaac came into this world and God's promise to them for a child was fulfilled. Can you imagine how exciting that was? Can you imagine how much they loved him? And here's what I'm going to tell you. Be careful when God blesses you with one of his promises that you don't get your eyes so fixed on the promise that you lose sight of the promise maker. Amen? Be careful that you don't lose sight of the promise maker because God is the promise maker and our eyes are to be forever on the promise maker, God Almighty. We're not supposed to make idols out of the promises that God fulfills in our lives. We're supposed to keep our eyes on the promise maker, amen? And then when we keep our eyes on the promise maker, God continues to bless us and continues to pour out and continues to use us for his glory. But as soon as you get your eyes off the promise maker and get your eyes on that promise, problems are going to start. And so it said God tested him. And he said take the promise that I gave you that I said that I was going to fulfill the other promises of making you a father of many nations. Take that promise and sacrifice that promise. Let me ask you. Here's a question. We find God instructing Abraham here to sacrifice the very child that was promised to them. The child that was supposed to fulfill the promise that God had for their lives. God called Abraham to sacrifice the promise. Here's the question. Could you, would you, give up the instrument of God's blessing in your life if he instructed you to do so? Could you or would you? Amen. Okay. Could you or would you? Sacrifice the instrument of God's blessing in your life if he called you to. Come on now, let's just get real because Christianity is for real. So maybe you have a, a, a nice little setup here and maybe God calls you to some other country 
Would you sacrifice all the blessings that God's given you here to be obedient and to go and to serve in that country? Would you? I don't know. You, you, you take the promise that God's given you. You take the blessings that you have. You think about the most precious thing in your life to you right now, and you ask yourself, would I sacrifice this if God asked me to? Abraham faced that exact question in his life. And this is what it says in verse 3. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. It says early the next morning. He didn't wait. He didn't hesitate. He obeyed. He didn't wait. He didn't hesitate. He obeyed. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled as I'm studying this out. I'm humbled as I'm reading this. I'm humbled and I'm saying, God, help me. God, help me come to this place where I could do what you've called me to do, even in the midst of great sacrifice. God, help me to come to this place. See, it's, it's too much about us so many times and, and so little about him. And we have to come to the place where we die to ourselves and we live for him. Because we have to be able to take that step when God calls us to take that step. And I, let me tell you this as well. There's nothing that God will require you or ask you to give up that he won't bless you a million times over again for your obedience. And so if God asks you to give something up, he's not asking you to give it up to hurt you or to take something from you. He's asking you to give it up to get something into your hands. Amen? He's asking you to give it up because so, he wants to get something in your hands. Early the next morning, Abraham got up, loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God told him about. Listen to this, four, verse 4, on the what day? Third. On the third day. On the third day. On the third day. Anybody else ever know about anything that happened on the third day? Huh? Was there anything exciting? Was there anything powerful? Was there anything amazing that ever happened on the third day? I think that it was on the third day that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. He raised him up from the grave. He was resurrected. And that is our hope as Christians. Amen. That was on the third day. And I just wanted to let you know that on the th there's something about the third day. There's resurrection power released on the third day. And it says here that Abraham came to that mountain on the third day. And he looked up and he saw the place that God had called him to go. The third day. Verse 5. He said to his servants, oh man, he said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. Are you listening? How does a person who has entered God's rest, how do they think? How do they speak? How do they act? Listen. We, the boy and I, we will worship and we will come back to you. Did you hear what he said? We will worship and we will come back to you. This is the very child that God had just said, take him up the mountain, sacrifice him on the top of the mountain, slay him on the top of the mountain. And here is Abraham saying, we are going to go up and worship and then we are going to come back down the mountain. We are going to go up and we are going to come back down. We're going to go up and then we're going to come back down. Guess what that is? That's a statement of faith. That's a profound statement of faith. What he was saying was that God is not a man that he should lie. And God said that it's this man, this boy right here, Isaac, that my offspring will be reckoned. And if God said it, write it down because it's true. It's going to happen. And so I'm going to go up the mountain. And then we're, we're both going to go up the mountain. And then we're both going to come down the mountain because God's not a man that he should lie. He had entered into God's rest. Some people have Abraham walking up the mountain all distressed and, and wringing his hands and, and worried about what's going to happen. That's a lie. That's a false picture of what actually happened. He was already in God's rest or there's no way he could have ever done it. You couldn't have done what he did in your own strength. We can't do what God's called us to do in our own strength. We need to enter into his rest. Because it's in his rest that we are empowered to walk in obedience. It's in his rest that we're empowered to walk in obedience. And unless you enter into his rest and you believe what he's promised, you cannot walk in obedience. It's too high of a price for us to pay to walk in obedience if we haven't already entered into the rest of God. 
But when you enter into the rest, you can go up with confidence. You can go up that mountain with confidence. And you can sacrifice whatever it is that God has called you to sacrifice. Because you know that God's going to resurrect it and bring it right back down to you. Amen. Abraham, verse 6, took the wood for the burnt offering. This could be sad if you didn't know the truth. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the firewood and the knife up the mountain. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and he said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Let me tell you something right now. Any father who loves their child would have broken down right there in tears. They would have broken down right there in tears because of the sacrifice was too great for them. You see, it wasn't about Abraham. It was about the promise. God's no respecter of persons. And if you take the promise and put it on the inside of you and let that promise come alive inside of you, you'll be able to do the same thing that Abraham could do. Not because of you, but because of the promise. You enter into that place of rest. But right here, when his son said that, he would have broken down in tears because the sacrifice would have been too much. But no, he continued up that mountain. Here's what he said to his son. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Abraham, again, proclaimed his faith in this passage by telling Isaac that God would provide the lamb. Who is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? Come on now. Who is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? That's Jesus. That's Jesus. Hallelujah. He is the Lamb of God. And here it is. God will provide the Lamb. Didn't he provide it, huh? He did. He provided it. Father Abraham is a type of Father God. Isaac being sacrificed is a type of Christ's sacrifice. And this is what I believe. This is not written down chapter and verse. I believe that Abraham acting in obedience and sacrificing Isaac was the seed necessary for the father to send Christ into the world. I believe that. I don't, it doesn't, it's not a big deal what I believe. That's what I believe. You can't find it in the scripture, so I'm not, you know, I'm not telling you to believe that. Just as I, I believe that just as our heavenly father sacrificed his only begotten son, Abraham sacrificed Isaac as a seed for the Christ to come. That's what I believe. I believe that there was something about Abraham sacrificing his son that, that, that caused God to be able to release his son into the earth to die on the cross for our sins. I believe that for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. I believe that he had to take that step of obedience in order for something in the spirit realm to click and for God to be able to send Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's just what I believe. You can... Put a little dot next to that one because that's just me. Verse 9, when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took his knife to slay his son. His hand is above his head. He's ready to come down with this knife in the heart of his son. He's about to slay his own son on that altar, right? He's doing it. He's already made up his mind. He's doing it, right? That, 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 that knife is about to drop, right? And it says, but the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Now I know that you fear God. What did it take for God to know that he feared him? It took a step of radical obedience in the life of Abraham for God to know that, that, that Abraham feared him. And when we're talking about fear, we're not talking about a runaway and hide kind of fear like Adam and Eve did in the garden. That's not the fear we're talking about. We're talking about a reverent awe of God where, where you hold God in this place of reverence and awe and respect. You know, some people... Don't do that. I think the church has lost this idea of the fear of the Lord. And I think that we need to have this back in our hearts and in our lives. That we look at God in reverence and in, in a way that we're in awe of Him. And we understand how amazing and incredible He is. You know, Jesus isn't our homeboy. 
That might be news to some people. Jesus isn't our homeboy. I've seen t-shirts. Jesus is my homeboy. No, he's not. You're deceived. Jesus is not your homeboy. He's the God of all creation. He's the Lord of the universe. He's your Lord and Savior. He is the one that loves you. He is the one that cares for you. Yes, he is. But he is God Almighty, all-powerful. And there are none like him. He's strewn out the stars in the sky and called them by name. Come on now. He's a great big God. And we don't try to bring God down to our level and disrespect him by doing that. We have fear and reverence and awe of God. And it says here that that's how, how did he know that Abraham feared him? Through an act of radical obedience. That's how he knew. Do you fear the Lord? Do you fear the Lord? I said the Lord does love us, but he doesn't overlook sin. And he doesn't look kindly on loose lifestyles. You want to live a loose lifestyle? You're not fearing God. You might say a prayer and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but if you go away living a loose lifestyle where anything goes, that's a devil from hell. And that's exactly where it'll take you. Make no mistakes about it. Make no mistakes about it. I don't want anybody within these walls to ever think that they can live a lifestyle of sin and waltz into heaven because it's just not scriptural. I know that it's not by works that anyone should boast. It, our, our salvation is by grace through faith. But there is something that when you are saved, truly saved by grace through faith, you have an appreciation and a thanks for God, and there's a transformation that takes place in your life. There are signs of a believer. We need to come back to that place of reverently fearing God and holding Him in awe and respect. I want to be somebody who is known as one who fears the Lord. Verse 13, dang. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. You see, God provided the lamb. He provided the lamb, just like Abraham said, God will provide. God will provide. This is a ram. God will provide. Verse 14, so Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. A lot of people quote this, this, this name of God, Jehovah Jireh. And, and, and I just pray that as you're using that name, Jehovah Jireh, that you understand the context in which it came. Because there was great sacrifice that came to see that name. Amen. There was great sacrifice that came to see that name. It was in the deep waters that that name was revealed. Amen? It wasn't in the shallow. It wasn't in that place where you're wading in, up to your ankles. It was when you're in over your head. That's where that name came from, Jehovah Jireh. Abraham became, started to know God as Jehovah Jireh, his provider, in that place of radical obedience. In that place of radical obedience. God's provision is poured out in the face of radical obedience. This kind of faith and obedience produced an encounter with God that provided the knowledge necessary to see God as Jehovah Jireh. Did you hear that, right? This kind of faith and obedience that he was walking in produced an encounter with God that provided the knowledge necessary to see God as Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Verse 15 then goes to show us the result of that. In verse 15 it says, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. And said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Because you have obeyed me, the promise will come into fruition in your life. Because you have obeyed me, my promise is released into your hands. Because you have obeyed me, you see how Abraham possessed the promise of God. Through faith, he entered into the rest of God, where he was at peace when he went up that mountain. And that's the only thing that empowered him to walk it out in obedience. 
And it was his obedience that it said brought forth the promise into his life. <laughs> Glory to God. Obedience brought the blessing and the manifestation of God's promise. But faith empowered Abraham to walk in obedience. Abraham could have never agreed to sacrifice Isaac without entering into the rest of faith. I know that you guys know this. We already talked about this. I'm a father. There's no way that I could have possibly done that unless I would have gotten a hold of a promise of God, put it in my heart, and, and disciplined myself to put it in my heart over and over and over again and allowed that, 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 that promise to produce faith on the inside of me to overcome the emotions that I, might, I would have felt in that situation. See, the, the promise has to be greater than your emotions. Until the promise is greater than your emotions, it won't produce fruit. But as soon as that promise becomes greater than the emotions, it's going to produce fruit in your life. And that fruit is for the kingdom. Amen? Some people say that Abraham was greatly disturbed. As we said, that's not true. We already said that these descriptions of Abraham couldn't be further from the truth. We looked at Abraham's statements of faith. We will come back, right? God will provide. He was confident that not only he would come back, but that Isaac would be with him when he returned. How did he do this? Hebrews 11, verse 17 to 19. Listen to this. Hebrews 11, verse 17 to 19. I'm just praying to God that you see this and that you go from this place with a deep revelation of God's promises and how we possess God's promises in our lives. And you begin to cause that process to work in your life so that you can experience intimacy with God and, and you can fulfill the plans and purposes that he has for your life. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 to 19. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Verse 19, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And, in so, and so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. He did receive Isaac back from the dead. He received him back from the dead. When he was going up that mountain, the reason why he could make those statements that he made is because he had already in his mind received Isaac back from the dead. He knew that God could raise the dead. He knew that God had made him a promise through Isaac. And he knew that if God made him slay his son, that God was going to raise him from the dead and that they were both going to go back down that mountain. You see, he had already settled it in his heart, in his mind, in his life. He had already settled it. He had already received Isaac back from the dead before he even got to that mountain. He'd already received Isaac back from the dead. He wasn't scared. He wasn't stressed. He wasn't anxious. He wasn't wringing his hands. He had already received the promise of God, and he knew that God would raise him from the dead if he, if he would have actually gone through with it and slain him. Come on now. Come on now. Are you walking in the rest of God in your life? Are you walking in God's rest in your life? I know that I'm challenged by this message. There are areas in my life where I need to go deeper with God. And I need to see God's promises producing fruit in my life. And I pray that you see the places in your life that you need to see God's promises producing in your life. And I pray that when you go from this place, you don't forget the word that you hear but that you would do the word that you hear. You would put it into activation in your life by meditating on the promises of God and allowing them to get in you and produce fruit in your life. I tell you what, you'll never be the same again if you do it. Abraham so believed God that he reasoned that God would have to raise Isaac from the dead in order to feel the fill of What kind of faith is that? What kind of faith is that? If I take this boy's life, God will raise him up. What kind of faith is that? It's unfeigned faith. It's radical faith that produces the promises of God in this earth. And that's what you and I have been called to. It's nothing about the man. It's about the promise and the process of him putting that promise in his heart and allowing it to do its work. Abraham had entered in the rest of God, the rest of faith. This is the rest that we've been called to. This empowered Abraham to accomplish the impossible. Entering God's rest empowered him to act in obedience without fear. 
One verse that I'm going to end with right now is 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15. 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says this. This is the confidence that we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of Him. You see, this is the rest of God. You find out what God's will is. You pray God's will back to Him. And when you pray God's will back to Him, you can be confident that what you're praying is a done deal because God hears you, and if God hears you, then you have the requests that you've asked of Him. What's the key? Praying according to God's will. And when you pray according to God's will, He hears you. And when He hears you, you know that you have already, before you see it, before it shows up, you already have the requests that you've asked of Him. Because you're praying according to His will. Your life is aligned to His will. And when your life is aligned to His will, there's nothing that God will hold back from you in accomplishing the plans and purposes that He has for you. Are you hearing me this morning? So when, when we pray for something, Philippians tells us to lift up our petitions with thanksgiving. Why do we thank God while we're still lifting up our petitions to Him? Because we know that we're praying according to His will. And if we're praying according to His will, we know that we already have the requests that we asked of Him. So we can thank Him now. We don't have to wait till we see it. Amen? See, that's true faith. That's one of those profound statements of faith that Abraham gave, right? When you are praising God and thanking Him before you get the answer to your prayers, when you're thanking God, that's a statement of faith. And God loves when you thank Him before you get what you're asking for because then He knows that you're asking in faith and He will not turn away from those who ask Him in faith. Amen? God is awesome. He's a wonderful God. Are you resting in the truth of God's promises? Or are you still trying to figure out how to get God's promises to come to pass in your life? Are you resting in the truth of God's promises? Are you still working like Abraham, like, like Abram and Sarai were to try to get God's promise to work and they produced an Ishmael? Or are you entering into the rest of God like Abraham and Sarah did and they produced Isaac, the promised child? These are the two lives that are placed before us to live. God says, I've placed life and death before you. Choose life. Life is found in walking in the Spirit. Life is found in entering God's rest by trusting Him and the promises that He's made. Hallelujah. It's not by might nor by power, but it's by His Spirit. Unless God builds the house, the laborers labor in vain who build it. Faithful is He who calls me, and He is doing it. He's causing it to come to pass. I can't do anything. Without God, I can't do anything. I can't do anything without Him. Apart from God, I can do nothing. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's nothing I can't do when God is with me. And when my life is aligned to His plans and purposes, there's nothing I can't do. There's nothing I can't do. I've said this before and I'll say it again. D.L. Moody told his son while he, he was on his deathbed, he spoke to his son and he said, Son, if God be your partner, make your plans big. There's nothing that you can't do when you are partnered with God. Amen? So don't think small. Think big. Let God stretch you so that you have to use your faith in order to reach out and grab a hold of what God has purposed for your life. Jesus Christ came down and lived a sinless life as He walked across this earth. And then He sacrificed everything. He gave His life for each one of us. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus lived a sinless life and he died on the cross. He was dead and buried and then he rose from the grave and he is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And if you will believe this truth, you can reach out and receive the gift of eternal life that comes through the finished work of Jesus Christ 
on the cross at Calvary, if you've not received this gift of eternal life, today is the day of salvation. And God is calling you to take this step. And it's very easy how you do it. You make a confession of your faith. And there's different ways to make a confession of your faith. We pray a prayer and we have you repeat after us as to that prayer and just you, you confess your faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that Jesus Christ came down to earth, that He died on the cross, that He was dead and buried, and He rose again from the dead, and that the blood of Jesus, the blood that He shed, washes away every sin in your life and opens up heaven to you. When you believe that and you confess that with your mouth, then are you saved. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's bow our heads right now and search our hearts and ask God, have I taken this step? Have I surrendered my life fully to you? Have I asked you to forgive me of my sins? Have I asked you to come into my life and be my Lord and Savior? Have I taken this step? If you haven't taken this step and you're in this room right now, with every head bowed, every eye closed, searching your hearts, raise up your hand right now from wherever you are if you haven't taken this step and you'd like to take this step this morning. If you're listening online, I want you to do the same thing. I want you to raise up your hand. It's not for me to see, it's for God to see. Amen. If you haven't prayed this prayer, if you haven't entered in and made a confession of your faith, if you haven't invited Jesus Christ into your life as your Lord and Savior, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Just say this. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you came to this earth. I believe that you were nailed to a cross. I believe that the blood that you shed forgives me of all of my sins. Right now, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins and to come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior. Father, I surrender to you right now. And I pray that you would give me the strength and the wisdom to walk with you each and every day of the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, God did exactly what you just asked him to do. He forgave you of your sins. And it says that in that moment of that confession of faith, that the Holy Spirit came into your life And that you are now a temple of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit now lives on the inside of you. And now the challenge that we all have as Christians is to die to ourselves so that we can allow Christ to live in and through us. So that we can come to that place where the Apostle Paul said, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ living in me. We want to come to that place, Lord. That's that place that we want to be at. Each and every one of us, God, we want to die to ourselves and live for you. If you prayed that prayer, you might have a question about what to do in the next days and weeks to come. And we have a booklet that says, now what? If you're in this room and you prayed this prayer, there's one right through this door on this uh, countertop over here to the right side of the countertop. These are free of charge. Just grab one as you go. Read it. Study it. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those questions for you. If you're listening online and you prayed that prayer, we want to get this booklet out to you. So just write free book in the comments section and we'll get in touch with you and we'll send one of these books out to you. We believe it'll be a blessing to you and it'll give you some answers to the questions that you have in the coming days and weeks. Hallelujah. So is there anyone here that as I was preaching was thinking of a particular area of your life where you have not entered into God's rest? You'll know it, it'll be easy to know because there'll be anxiety there, there'll be stress there, there'll be frustration there. You've not entered into God's rest in that area of your life if you're experiencing those things. And so if you have that need or if you have any other need, maybe a physical healing, maybe something else, I just want to open the altar as we sing this last song. And I want to give you guys the opportunity to come up. And then in about a couple minutes after that, I'm going to pray over everybody else a blessing of God as you go from this place. Amen. So let's stand to our feet and worship the Lord together.